I'm a, oh, oh, <laughs> okay. Joe, you're one of those students that gets up and wanders around all the time, I can tell. <laughs> Good morning. It actually was. Uh, we welcome John Kirkendall to our class this morning. John is an anchor for the Covenant class. He teaches us. <laughs> he teaches us. A dead weight. <laughs> he nurtures us. He inspires us. We love you, John. Thank you. I thought Misty was going to introduce me, and I'm really delighted, Pam, that you were the one to do it. <laughs> this is this is a course I have been hoping to do, working on for a long time, and. I want to begin with what I indicated on the outline as, as two uh, modest disclaimers, maybe not modest, but disclaimers. Number one, for one of the first times in my life, my teaching life at least, uh, I'm going to be building this plane while I'm flying it, and you all are going to be the crew, so you've got to help me along with all this. Uh, I've, I've read and studied and thought and had a trial run with Rick and some of my other colleagues in the... Uh, retired minister's group, and we enjoy doing it, but I just don't know where this thing's going to go. So, so bear with me. Three weeks is all we've got, so it won't hurt a whole lot. That's the first disclaimer. The second one is I want to make sure that you know when I choose this topic that this is not in any way a critique or a rap on the wonderful pastoral leadership we have at DCPC. I don't know about you, but I'm just overwhelmed with the skills, with the diligence, with the commitment, with the faith of the people we have around us as our trained clergy. And I would never want anything to 
that I would say in this course to, to in, indicate otherwise because that's just, just where I am and, and I are one, so I know what this is all about. But I think, I think we're singularly blessed and I thought maybe the first place we ought to start off in this course is for you to throw out a few adjectives of the qualities that you think are significant in ministerial leadership. And this is just, uh, Pam's gonna be my Vanna White and work on the board over here. <laughs> and if you, this is gonna be interactive, so you got to talk too. What kinds of adjectives would you use to describe a faithful pastor? Go ahead, just talk. Compassionate, Compassionate too, at the same time, great. Inspirational. Honesty? Okay. Okay. Organized? Whoa! <laughs> what else? Trustworthy. Sorry? Trustworthy? I hear voices in these glasses and such. I can't see who you are out there. So, sorry. Trustworthy? Informative. Courageous? And informative? All right. Faithful. Faithful. Creative. Creative. Okay, slow down. No more ideas for a minute. Um, all right. Preacher. Good preacher. Okay. Check that one again. Uh, I've got one that I just have to put in because I think it's very significant, and that is prophetic. I didn't say pathetic, I said prophetic. <laughs> what, what, what else you got? This is a good list. I, I don't want to push this any further, but I just want us to reflect upon the kind of profile that we see around us in ministerial leadership. And most of these things I see up here are things that I could really put one to one on the people that, that lead us on a regular basis. So I, I would say gratitude we ought to have for these people that we've got. And I would say anything that we do, and we're going to do a little weird stuff in the course of, of these next two weeks in terms of who these people are. But, but basically speaking, we're trying to get a fix on how the, the society in which we live uh, envisions the pastoral ministry. And, and one of the best ways to do this is to dig into fiction because fiction is kind of a mirror of the culture in which we live. And if we div, dig into fiction over time, as I'm going to say a little bit later, we're going to see a kind of a progression or a path that changes from time to time. Now, let me give you an o overview of the cor course very quickly. And this is not complicated at all. Today, I hope we're going to introduce the subject a little bit and then I think after I've tested the audience, which I love to do, uh, we will think about what the next two weeks look like. Next week, week, week two, I would like to go to literary figures, fictional literary figures. And I, I, mean, I mean fictional, somebody who is central to a novel or an occasional short story, which gives a certain profile of a minister. Uh, then week three, the last week we got together, I would like to do personalities on film, um, movies, old and new, um, videos or TV series, things like that. Again, with the minister being a central or very significant character. Now, there are a lot of times when you see something which is really, really wonderful, and the minister is there, but he is a part of a whole gathering of people who are doing things at the same time. I want somebody that we can find a distinct personality and try to analyze it a little bit. Now, notice that I put the emphasis on fiction uh, rather than uh, a bio. Missy and I were talking yesterday, and she said, what about a man called Peter? And I said, well, you know, that's a real person. He, and Missy said, the way he wrote it up, his wife wrote it up, it was better than any minister I've ever heard about. So, <laughs> so, so not, not a Peter Marshall, nor a, a documentary about Dr. King or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or something like that. Wonderful personalities, real personalities, and we can discover them 
uh, as we look at that sort of literature, but that's not what we're dealing with, Simon. We're dealing with fiction. So we want to look at people as some person has portrayed them as representative uh, of the ministerial office and also somewhat representative of the society in which we live. So that's the way we're going to go about it. Now, next thing on the outline that I put down there for you is the contemporary challenge. I call that the, the trust factor because one of the things that we get reminded of time and again, I looked up a couple of them yesterday, uh, time and again we're reminded of how the public views certain vocations and professions and how they rank them in terms of trustworthiness. And it's a sad story, folks. <laughs> you may have seen some of these things. The one that I looked at yesterday that really stunned me was, it starts off with scientists, doctors, teachers, that's okay. Goes on down through the armed forces, the, the police, judges, TV news people, right on down to number 12 or 13. I can't remember which one it was. And that was ministers, right jammed in there between journalists and ad executives. <laughs> And, and here's the thing about it, 28% of the population in this particular survey, and surveys are what they are, but 28% of this survey said that these are people you can trust a minister. And 42% of the people said you cannot trust a minister. Now think about that for a minute. I want audience participation once again. Why is that so? What's going on? I think everybody in this room would not rate our ministers in this church untrustworthy. And yet, you might have a different attitude about the ministry in general. Why is that so? Any ideas? The sexual abuse. Thing sexual abuse? Well, I think just secularism by a... Secular, the, the tsunami of secularism, which is coming. More and more nuns, week by week, year by year. Okay, anything else? As in sexual and what else? Uh, money. Money? Okay. Steve? I would, I would compare it to another profession, and that is we, we all know that Congress is weighted low in all opinion polls, so that people can see the votes of your incumbents. Yeah. They're all the way down at the bottom of my list, by the way. <laughs> Politicians. <laughs> not, not my personal list, the one I read. Yeah. I'm sorry, I should. Politicians was the most recent thing. And I apologize, people in the radio land out there, wherever you are. Uh, I, I, I shall. Thank you, John. Um, I think people are jaunted. Like it's, it's not the ministry, it's the people that are jaunted in society. Okay, so a kind of negativity in society. All right, good. I think part of yes. it is just the high expectations. unrealistic expectations <laughs> of the people involved, all right? That's good. I got one that I was thinking about, I've thought about a lot over the years, and that is televangelism. I believe the spate that we got about, what, 15, 20 years ago that continues somewhat abated now, but all these personalities that were there, they were, they were phony, and you knew they were. And they'd taken over the medium. There was a time when I would have said that the use of, of radio and television by ministers was uh, something that, that had a good reputation. But you can no longer say that. So we've got all these things working here that have to do with the fact that we're down to number 12 or 13 in terms of what we think of our ministers. Well, I wanted to kind of raise the fact with you that... Uh, and I mentioned this just in passing earlier, that, that fiction, when all is said and done, is a mirror of the culture in which we live. And uh, as we see our culture change, and as we see the place of ministry in the culture change, it's, we're bound to see changing perceptions that are going to find expressions, maybe early on, maybe almost predictive, in fictional literature and, and fictional film, we're going to see kind of inklings of what people think the society is really like, and it's changing all the time. Different media describe and assess those sorts of perceptions in different ways. 
Uh, you all remember Marshall McLuhan? You remember McLuhan and his hot mediums and his cold mediums? Well, well, uh, he started out when television was just coming into its own, and he said it was such a hot medium, and it burned up its, termino its, uh, its topics very quickly because it hit them and got away from them. The other side of that is it's a hot medium. It does things quickly, but people kind of lose interest quickly as well. So we find ourselves in a situation in which, uh, at least with, with film, we, we find ourselves in a situation in which there's a certain half-life. It lasts for a little while accurately, and then uh, it's off the table. Now, when you think about television expressions of ministry, I, I can only think of two or three that have lasted for any significant period of time, and that's so because these are very unique and somewhat peculiar characters. So, uh, television, hot medium, uh, you get a good picture, you get it quickly like that, and yet it may not have a lasting impact as much as something that's written down, that someone has thought about and written about, and people read it, reread it, go back to it, get a feeling for what that implies for the larger society. And I'm going to say something more about this in a minute, but the larger society, not simply the larger society in which we live, but the society in which other things happen uh, a, a society in, in, in which other times and other places are represented. Now, if we think about the changing historical perspectives on which, uh, in, in which the ministry is perceived just now, uh, I, I was struck by two things as I was preparing for, for this course. One was uh, an expression, some of you in this room may be in the study group that's reading uh, Phyllis Tickle's book, uh, the Great Emergence. It's a very interesting book, and I, I've been invited to sit down with this group, which I think is all women except for yours truly. I'm going to sit down with them and talk about this book a little bit. They've been reading it for several weeks. Uh, Phyllis, Tick Trick Phyllis Tickle, T-I-C-K-L-E, Phyllis Tickle writes that there have been four basic periods in Christian history. Uh, the, 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 the most recent one to us she refers to as the Great Reformation. And everybody in this room knows what that is. 1517, October the 31st, Martin Luther at the Wittenberg Castle, nailing 95 theses on the door, if he did, and if it happened that way, it may have, may not. But in any event, that begins what we think of as the Great Reformation, which eventuated in uh, a proliferation of different approaches to how you be a Christian in the Western world. Uh, Martin Luther kind of cracked the thing open so you no longer have one monolithic Catholic society but you've got a Protestant proliferation at the same time and as we all know and have witnessed over the years that continues to expand almost uh, in a kind of a, a nuclear fission sort of way in which new Christian expressions come out all the time. But basically what we've had over these last 500 years, basically what we've had is a, a Roman Catholic approach to things and a Protestant, in quotes, a Protestant approach to things. So in these last 500 years, we kind of know what the lay of the land is, at least in European and American uh, history. Prior to that, we have what uh, Phyllis T Trickle referred to as, uh, wait a minute, I got to get my notes right here, uh, as the great schism which you probably, how many people in the room want to hold up their hands and say what the great schism was all about? Joe's up a little bit there. In, in the year 1054, there was a division within Christendom, which at that time covered um, uh, portions of, of Asia and Africa and into uh, Europe. And there was a division between the people who thought that the Pope in Rome was the person who ought to be obeyed, and on the other hand, the Pope, in, I mean the Patriarch, in Constantinople was the one to be followed, and in 1054 there was a breach, once and for all. It came over issues that, in retrospect, seemed to be almost picayune, but it was more a political thing in most respects than it was a religious thing. And the Great Schism was important because at that point, about uh, halfway from here to Jesus, as far as we're concerned, the Great Schism broke open what had been a more or less monolithic movement, which always presumed that everybody was connected to everybody else. And then we got two focal centers of power, 
the Eastern Church, Constantinople then, and then becoming the national sort of thing that we know as Orthodoxy, Greek Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodoxy, and all the rest, and then the Western Church, which at that time was Roman Catholic. So you get that kind of great schism. You go back 500 more years, and this is where Phyllis Tickle gets a little cute, but she says, go back 500 more years, and what you get is Gregory the Great. That's not quite a great reformation or a great schism, but Gregory the Great, who was Pope, uh, Gregory the First, uh, he was Pope uh, in the late 6th century on into the 7th century, significant to us because he came at a point where, in which Technically speaking, Christendom was collapsing because Christen, Christendom from the 4th century on had been more or less synonymous with the Roman Empire. And you have all this interplay of politics and religion there. Gregory comes along at this point realizing that the Roman Empire has probably breathed its last breath and there's going to be a great vacuum within what used to be the provinces of Rome. And what Gregory did was important was he emphasized something that... Uh, that was abroad in Christianity since probably the late first, early second century, and that was monasticism. And with using the rule of St. Benedict, who, who was more or less contemporary, the Catholic Church moved into a kind of a fortification mode in which the, the, the whole holdings of Christianity, the thought, the pa practices, the patterns, everything else, were encapsulated by and large in monasteries. That, and, and I would say convents as well, women and men both, but apart from society, and there, at least in part, as conservators of this faith that was probably going to be seriously challenged by the fact that there was no longer, quote-unquote, a Christendom in the same way that it was as synonymous with the Roman Empire. So Gregory's contribution, and this would be, the Latin, roughly speaking, the latter half of the first millennium after Christ, uh, Gregory's idea was we've got to save these things and the best way to save them is to pull them into ourselves. So that would be the third great turning point or, or, or period of turning in Christianity. And the first one, of course, the first 500 years was typified by several things. One was a kind of an all-out missionary effort to try to bring more and more people into this movement. Another thing that was going on was an effort which got kind of kind of uh, precise and I would say even picky even at time, and that was to try to define what it is that we believe. So you have these seven ecumenical councils, some of which take on topics of great moment as to how you can say Jesus is God and man at the same time, and some of which take on things which in retrospect look to me to be fairly trivial, such as are you going to have idols, icons in church, or are you not going to? Okay, you can figure it out either way. But these councils were trying on, on an intellectual level and a, and a societal level too, a theological level, they were trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian in a kind of a classic sense. The study of that particular period in Christian theology is called patristics. And although sometimes our modern eyes are kind of dull and our eyelids go down when we think about it, most of the basic facts about the Christian movement theologically are things which have their roots in that first 500-year period. So now, what we've got is Phyllis, Phyllis Tickle saying that you've got these four basic periods beginning from the time of Jesus and coming down to the 20th century, and then her argument is going to be the great emergence is number five. And we don't know exactly what that looks like, but we're going to think about it in, as she leads us through this study. That's enough on her, but I just wanted to mention the fact that you have these vast, vastly differing attitudes as to what a minister looks like in society over each one of these periods. You can do the same thing with American religion if you want to. You can go back to colonial America and look at what the image of ministry is there, then look at the new nation, the new American nation, then look at the period between the Civil War and, and let's say, World War I, then look at the period from then on down to probably close to the end of the 20th century, but not quite there, say the 1970s, 80s, and there, and then we turn another corner. You've got five different, fairly distinct periods in terms of what the Christian community looks like in the American situation, and in each one of those, you're going to have a different attitude of what ministry looks like as well. So this changing historical perspective is going to be very, very significant for us as we think about what 
what the minister looks like to us from this particular vantage. Now, uh, a couple of things I want to mention beyond that. I've, I've, the outline is in error at one point because after I got to thinking about it, I want to swap over and put the last two of these bullet points on the document uh, in, separate, in different order. So let me speak first about this bifocal view of analysis. And I, I said to myself as I wrote it down, it may just not be bifocal, but trifocal, because when you think about looking at a work, a literary work or a, a, a film work or something like that, when you think about looking at it, you've got three things to work with. One thing is the writer and his, uh, the Germans use a word that we used to love in seminary, it's called Zitz im Leben, that means his life setting. You look at the life setting of the writer, what's going on around him? Then secondly, you got to go look at the story which he is describing. It may be contemporaneous with him, or it may go back a couple of hundred years, or it may be, one of my favorites is Brother Cadfell, it may go all the way back to the 12th century, I think it is. So the writer's sitting here, uh, in this case, Ellen Peters was sitting in the 20th century, looking back 800 years at what the ministry looked like back then. So you've got at least a bifocal view. And then the third thing is, you and I are sitting here reading it where we are, which may, in this instance, be uh, uh, Edith Parger to Ellen Peters was writing up until about 20, 15, 20 years ago about my friend Brother Cadfell, but it, it's close in hand at that. But what about, just for example, Nathaniel Hawthorne? writing about uh, uh, the Reverend Dimsdale in the Scarlet Letter. Now, that's, that's way back for us. We're going to have to go fishing and try to figure out what it is from here that makes it look like all right to us. And then we look at Nathaniel Hawthorne, who wasn't living there. He was living at least a century later than that. And so he's got this vantage, too. So what we have at least is a bifocal view. We may have a trifocal view of what we need to look at in order to figure out what's going on in this story. And that's what we're going to be trying to do the next two weeks. Now, finally, and this is just kind of fun, but um, several I've read several uh, authors on this who try to set out varieties of personality types in the ministry. And you're going to love this, and you're going to make up your own as we go along. But one of them said, this is a quote from one of them, uh, ministers can be religious misfits, harsh Puritans, incorrigible scoundrels, secular businessmen, perpetrators of oppression, victims of belief, prudent believers, phony preachers, re reactionaries, and social activists. And probably the list could go on. And then another more thoughtful person says, as we look at these personality types in literature and in film, we're looking for certain basic factors that make these people significant. The heroes, martyrs, those who've suffered for the faith, the counselors' confession, con confessors, those who are there to listen to people and try to help them figure out their lives. The fools for Christ, and that list is interminable, I'm sure. <laughs> the detectives, that's the one that I, I love most. We're going to come back to that. The detectives, uh, and it's interesting, this, this writer postulates that detectives who are Roman Catholics have a lot more uh, priests who are Roman Catholics and detectives have a lot more staying power than those who are Protestants. I think he said because of the mystery in the whole thing. But in any event, detectives, people who are passionate for better or for worse, people who are failures also for better or for worse, and then people who are just frustrated and those who are mere figureheads of something which is much more profound than they are. Those sorts of people are these personality types that we're going to be looking at for the next two weeks. So that's what I've got to tell you this basically for today, but I want to get you to tell me some stuff now. So we're going to take 20 minutes here. I'm so glad there's so many people here because you're surrounded by people perhaps you don't know very well, which is good. Um, my lovely assistant, is going to hand out, <laughs> that would be Sterling. Sterling is going to hand out the pop quiz. <laughs> and here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this quiz by yourself. No looking on other people's papers. Uh, take it for, for, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to do it. Just think about these questions. You'll see them, they're very, I think they're very straightforward questions. And having done this, there, there are basically two questions on this page. Top half has to do with literature 
bottom half has to do with some sort of film expression. So you got to give me two names on that paper. All right, it's all coming out. These are the logistics I don't have to worry about. <laughs> and all thanks to Sterling and John and Pam. All right. The time begins. The time begins now. The test is lasting 10 minutes, and then I'm going to say pencils up. I got ahead of my slide. Oh, I, I knew you'd bail on me. <laughs> you know my name. <laughs> yeah, I do. And in fact, you're the only one that led me. Thank you. More in the traditional sense. There's a boy, you know, there's a vague area in between there, Eric, but I'd say more somebody who occupies the ministerial office. No, <laughs> I've seen people sleep, but other than that, <laughs> thank you, John. Both, top and bottom, or you could take a 50 on the quiz either way.
Take about three more minutes. Now, I want you to pick out somebody you're not kin to. Um, we don't want any intramural strife here. So I want, I want you to pick out somebody you're not kin to and swap papers with that person. Oh, yes. Come on, come on. What, what did you come to Sunday school for? No, I've got some. Thank you. Okay, everybody, everybody. All, all of you all, I've lost my class. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, I'll, I'll, 
I'll see you all next week. I'm going home. <laughs> uh, here's what I want now. Okay, we got to stop now. <laughs> no, it's all right. Okay, great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank let's, you. let's bring it to a close. <laughs> John, you started something really heavy. This is great. <laughs> all right. Here's what we want now, you all. And Pam, you're going to have to work up here again for me if you don't mind. Um, I've asked you to look at somebody else's paper. And that person may not want you to say what they wrote down, but it's all right because we're all one happy family here. But I want to get you just at random. First of all, let's go to the top question and, and give us the names of fictional people that ought to be considered on this list. And Pam, that'll be column number two here. Should I write the people down? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you have to spell for them. Father, Father, Father Tim. Father Tim, T-I-M. T-I-M. Jan Karen. Somebody else. Reverend Dimsdale. All right. God. Oh, gosh. I don't remember his name either. I remember that book, though. Yeah. Uh, Cold Sassy Tree Pastor. We'll oh, just put that. Uh, no name, right? No, no name. Yeah. Okay. Just. Who's the Baptist preacher? Yeah. Baptist preacher. I remember he said, son, she's been dead two weeks. She won't get any deader. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? Uh, all right. Anybody else find something interesting in somebody else's paper? Leah? Father Ralph the Book of Psalms. There he is. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm not sure I can handle that one. Uh, Thornbirds. Good. Joe? The Jane Austen book is a Pride and Prejudice, but anyway, where the vicar very much wants to marry one of the sisters. <laughs> I can't remember his name, but he's just a, he's a mess. Kalsaban. What is it? Kalsaban, the one that was the, the scholar. The no, this guy's real sleazy. Anyway, whatever. Anyway, he's a Jane okay. Austen. We'll, we'll find him. Pride and Prejudice. Prejudice. We'll see if we find him. Who else saw, saw one that somebody else wrote down that was of interest? I thought about another one at first, but the, the rabbi, and I can't remember his name, in Pete Dexter's book, The Snows in August. Oh. I, I, I don't know who that is, but I was thinking about Friday, the rabbi, I slept late. But that, uh, who else? You all listen to other people? Did they say anything worth hearing? Okay. Well. Mr. Collins. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. If I'm not getting any more out of that, then let me try the next thing. What adjectives did you see that were remarkable? Now, we have, I actually put two or three down, and we've got 40 people here, so we're not going to put down 120. But did you see an adjective that struck your fancy? Judgmental. Judgmental. Mm. Austere. 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 Ambitious. All right. Ambitious. Conflicted. Okay. None of these are good. Well, <laughs> gosh, yeah. <laughs> Compared to the list over I there. Know, I <laughs> okay. Uh, disciplined. 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 Thank you, Jeff. Oh, there you go. Hey, John, can you just repeat them? Forgiving. Forgiving. John's not very good at that. He's got to work on that. Naive. Naive. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> if, if the shoe fits, I guess. 
Any others? Charming. Oh, good. I guess. Charming. What was that last one? Charismatic. Charismatic. Down to earth. <laughs> Back to that again. <laughs> he, was, he was looking for that. Richard Chamberlain. Just put Richard Chamberlain up there. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's 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 drop to the bottom question now, and let's do the same thing all over again. Um, what about uh, personalities in movies or TV shows or any, anything like that. Father, the, Brown. Father Brown. You want the name? Yeah, over here. Yeah. No, the column over here. Okay. Yeah, I know, but then we can't do the adjectives for them. No, no, we'll get those on the list somewhere. Okay, all right. Father Brown on the Father list. Father Brown, is that what? Yep. Sure. He said, if you watch um, Dance with Beast Theater, Grantchester. Oh, gosh, yeah. I can't remember what his name was, but Grantchester. Yeah. Will something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah, <laughs> you hit me right between the eyes. I'm going for that one. The Vicar of Dibley. Elmer Gantry. Golly. The priest in the exorcist. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to sleep at night. I'm going <laughs> to have <laughs> Vicar of Dibley. Vicar of Dibley. Got some others? Father Mulcahy. Father Mulcahy. Yay, yay, yeah, yay. Yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, this is getting good. Uh, uh, I don't know that one. Oh, I'm too young. <laughs> <laughs> My mother wouldn't let me watch TV. <laughs> but what's the name again? Seventh Heaven, Eric Camden. Eric Camden in Seventh Heaven. Okay, I, I do know of Seventh Heaven. Robert Allen from Robots and Friends. Oh, gosh, yeah. Thomas Marshfield from uh, John Updike, A Month of Sunday. Ooh. Oh, golly. Steve, you read that? I watched that? In seminary. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a representative sample at least. And listen, I, I'm open to this. If you get home um, and think about a name you want to drop in the hopper. Now, we can't, obviously we can't do all of these. And we may do a couple of these that because of professorial prejudice, I want to put in whether you named them or not. But... If you think of somebody when you get home and say, ooh, this would be just great, email me. And if I'm still on the college dole. I'm jokirkendall at davidson.edu. And you can just email me with a name. You can do it anonymously if you're embarrassed. But, <laughs> but I, I'd like to look at it because next week we're going to work on the literary ones. The next week, John, bless his heart, and I are going to sit down together and we're going to figure out how to do the film thing. So <laughs> we'll work on that. Now, I wanted to kind of come back around before we quit, and it's time to quit, almost. I wanted to come back around to the, to the questions that I put at the end of the little outline for today and see if you can uh, reflect upon those a little bit, the thinking ahead part of this. Um, I'm just, I'm assuming, but I don't want to make the assumption, do you think we should seek variety? I assume you do. If you think otherwise, please let me know. Uh, in the examples that we choose. Uh, and then I'm just thinking about ministerial types, not these people up here, but what sorts of ministers what we be looking like? Should we be looking at evangelists? Should we be looking at a purity? What, what types of ministers do you think would be interesting to study? Tragic. Tragic? Oh. Stay right, all right, okay. I got either it. people online can't hear us, so I, I, either talking to a mic or John. I, I picked it up. Tragic. People that go wrong. Oh. Criminals. 
flawed, okay. All right, good. What else? You want any good guys or gals? Well, that's it. We got Grandchester, we got Thornbirds. We don't have Father Brown, particularly. Uh, gosh, I can see where this class is going right now. <laughs> uh, anything else on that question? Yeah. yeah, what? Ministers who go into or come out of other professions. Okay, second vocation or first, first to second vocation. Or, or maybe, I, I put words in your mouth, maybe tent-making ministers too as well. I'll see what I can figure out on that. Okay. Uh, the next one I asked was, what questions should we ask about these characters to kind of suss them out? What are we looking for? Where do they come from? Origins. Okay, good. Motivations. Motivations. Uh huh. Vocations. So, why are they so conflicted? Why are they conflicted if they are? Yeah, but quite often they are. They are, yeah. Well, good characters often are in fiction, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Be a man called Peter all over again, miss. <laughs> no. So those are good questions. Why did they come here? If they're conflicted, why? Any other things you think of? Nice. How do they deal with being on a pedestal? And why are they on the pedestal? <laughs> and why? And why? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Where? In what setting are they doing ministry? Because those things are quite significant in, in fiction, certainly. Also, what's going on in the life of Lord? Yeah, okay. Oh, absolutely that. What difference have they made? What difference have they made? Uh, we've only got two weeks, Jesse. <laughs> Somebody else said something. What is their purpose? Why are they doing Oh. 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 What is their purpose? Okay. Gee. Well, usually, I, I'm looking. I, I ask for a main character because we get more more of a profile. We get some snapshots here and there that are just wonderful, but they may not be enough to go on. So, yeah, probably a main character. Okay. So then, the last question I put to you was, what are what lessons to be learned? Why are we reading these things anyway? You all know who Will Williman is? The uh, Methodist bishop, uh, professor, and all that. Will, Will wrote a preface to one of the books I read, and he said he'd read something like 100, 110 books about ministers, fictional books about ministers, which made me think Methodist bishops don't have a whole lot to do with their time. <laughs> but I would never say that to Will. But, but anyway, he, he was just saying, what you get here is this kind of, kind of panorama of different approaches to what a minister is and what a minister accomplishes and what the kind of outcome of all this is for the rest of us reading these books, which we do read. So it's interesting to think about. Well, that's what I've got for you for today. Now... You want to say any other things, uh, thoughts that have come up before we stop? We've got about five minutes, if you can think of things that ought to be said, so we can make the next two weeks more delightful for those of you who choose to come back. <laughs> okay. In preparation yeah. for um, next week, Ooh. Um, could you give us an idea of, of perhaps what we should read or familiarize ourselves with before we come into class so that we can mm -hmm. partake in the discussion? In oh. other words, you know, tell us, the ministers, <laughs> that you're, 
<laughs> Give us, no, just to, to yeah. would that be appropriate or not? It'd be appropriate if I could do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, well, I, I'm, I'm taking in all these things that you all are saying, and I'm, I had some um, preconceptions about what I wanted to do, which are now, some of them going out the window, but other, others are, are reinforced. Uh, I, I want to talk, I th I'll give you two or three names I think definitely ought to be in next week's yep. list. One of them we've already talked about, that's uh, uh, the Reverend Dimsdale in, in the Scarlet Letter. Uh, I had started out this whole idea thinking I wanted to do Elmer Gantry, but I'm not sure I do now, but <laughs> if you want to catch up on it. And that, of course, that's a movie, but it was a book well before it was a movie. There's one that you haven't mentioned that I would like to try to do, and it's one of the harder ones, but John Ames, who is the hero in Marilyn Robinson's books, the series of books. Uh, one of the writers I read recently said, John Ames is a martyr, but a different sort of martyr. He's a congregation minister out in the Midwest, and he is uh, in the latter stages of his life, and he was trying to save a prodigal son, and it's a very powerful, powerful thing. And I think she has two, three novels, I think, that carry on this John Ames figure, but I would like to look at him because this is not the kind of martyr that gets burned at the stake. This is the kind of guy that gives his life over in a, in a, in a silent, almost depressed atmosphere, and I want, I want to do him. So if you haven't read, uh, golly, I'm drawing a blank on the name of that first one. Gilead, Gilead. If you haven't read Gilead, you might look at Gilead for sure. So, John, uh, next week when you review the characters, would you give us a synopsis for those of us who haven't Absolutely. read those particular yeah, books? That, that's so we don't have to be scared of coming no, if we no, haven't. No, no, no. <laughs> Jane, you're the only one who's asked that, so you may be the only one who reads anything. No, I'm, I'm going to give a synopsis first of all. Then we're going to kind of do an assessment of the environment that trifocal or bifocal view, and then we're going to talk about what the person means. And as I look at it, we might be able to get five done if you come early and stay late. <laughs> uh, but but I, we, we'll do about five of them, and I think Dimsdale will definitely be there. And I, I kind of presume John Ames. Now, I haven't gotten to the thorn bird yet, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Make no promises on that. Well, listen, thank you all for this and for your willing participation. This has been fun. And the rest of these are going to be fun, too, in a different way, I hope. So thank you, John. Happy Sunday. Thank you. Bye.